Well, it's gone silent, so I guess we better begin, right? <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 11th Future for Nature Awards. I can't tell you what an enormous pleasure it is for me to come here every year and to see all of you again who represent this wonderful legion of people who are part of the growing environmental movement in Europe. And of course to come here um, to this wonderful place on this beautiful spring day and to get the chance to listen to these very uh, interesting, um, impassioned and effective young people who are the winners each year of the Future for Nature Awards. Um, I'm delighted today to be able to welcome a few of our, our behind-the-scenes crew. Uh, we've got Masha Vorontsova and Vivek Menon uh, from our International uh, Selection Committee. Can you please stand up so everyone can give you an applause? Uh, we have one of our previous awardees from 2016, Vitsa, who's somewhere in the audience. Where are you? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Our wonderful ambassador, Dr. Freik Vonk, who's here today, which is really great. Um, We have some of the students from the Future for Nature Academy. We have our wonderful uh, guest of honor, Dalton Kruis, and of course, our three winners, Geraldine, Trang, and Adam. So welcome, everybody. It's going to be a great day. Thank you. Well, yesterday, um, I had the great pleasure of visiting the new mangrove exhibit here at Burger Zoo. And um, walking quietly through this wonderful space with the Van Hoof family, with all of these iridescent butterflies from Belize um, flying around our heads and, and watching the manatees tumble through great swarms of fishes in their enormous um, tank, um, Alex was, was walking next to me and, and just quietly dropped um, a little bit of information that Royal Burger Zoo has managed to secure 35,000 hectares in Belize, which is now a protected area of uh, tropical f uh, habitat. Uh, mangrove forest, um, a subtropical, uh, sorry, mangrove, subtropical forest, etc., which they've managed to secure. And he did it so casually, and he stopped me in my tracks. I was absolutely stunned. Um, because you see, it was an example to me of how a zoo modernizes, how they make themselves relevant in the current context. It was an example of how you can both lead by example at home by being the gold standard for animal keeping in Europe and at the same time have such a tremendous impact on real conservation efforts out in the field. And of course, this is just one of the many projects that Royal Burger Zoo is involved in, the conservation projects. Um, my favorite one, of course, is the Future for Nature Awards. Um, and it's thanks to the zoo, to uh, the Van Hoof family, the National Lottery, Postcode Lottery, Africa's Eden, the Nilevat, Nilevat, Logistics, and the Van Wilraven Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> um, that Future for Nature, <laughs> I'm sorry, I really have a problem with these Dutch, the pronunciation of these Dutch names, um, that Future for Nature really does continue to stand head and shoulders um, above everything else that they do when it comes to real conservation impact. Um, and as of this year, Future for Nature has now supported 33 conservationists who are saving species and habitats in countries um, and places as far flung as the tropical forests of Papua New Guinea, uh, um, of Colombia and of the Congo, uh, the flood plains of Brazil, um, the remote uh, mountains of the far east in Russia and even the fringes of Iraq's war-torn desert. For any of you who were last here, um, you would have heard those speeches that we, um, of those incredible young people. And of course, every year, the number of young people who are being supported and who are being, becoming part of this alliance is growing. Um, and, and that gives me enormous strength and enormous hope, because when you're out there on the front line, it can sometimes feel so lonely and so isolated. And Future for Nature is really becoming more and more of a family for all of these people. 
And it's really because Future for Nature puts its faith in young conservationists that I think they are unique. Um, because it's really putting their money where their mouth is. It's a vote in the future, in the future that we all want to live um, and we all believe in. And it's a vote of confidence in the abilities of these passionate, energized, inspired young people who are working so hard to change the world. Um, and really, it's thanks to this award that they are able to make a significant difference in their home countries, um, to realize their dreams and to amplify their efforts and break through these constant stalemates that we seem to come up against so often in conservation. So today we thought we'd kick off with some words of wisdom from one of our future, uh, our previous award winners, Pat uh, Patricia Magisi, who's from the um, Lowland uh, Tapir Conservation Initiative and who's also the chair of the IUCN uh, Tapir Specialist Group. Hello everyone, this is Patty Magisi from Brazil. I'm a tapir conservationist. And I was one of the first three uh, winners of Future for Nature in 2008, 10 years ago. It's been a while. And uh, whenever I think about 2008, it makes me, it makes me, it brings these wonderful memories. And I don't think I'll ever be able to articulate how grateful I am for, for this award, uh, for the opportunity that was given to me to expand our taper conservation efforts the recognition, the prestige that it brought to, to tapers, it was critical. It was, it, was, it was a fantastic opportunity that was given to us. A few years after receiving the award, I was invited to be part of the international selection panel, which I accepted. I learned so much about all these amazing people doing incredible things around the world. It's really reassuring. It gives us hope. It makes, me, it makes me feel less lonely um, doing conservation in Brazil. Uh, it's very, very rewarding to, to receive the, the proposals and to have the opportunity to, to read about these incredible people. And tonight you have three of them with you. They're all doing incredible uh, work in their respective countries. Um, and to the three of you, I want to say congratulations. And I want to say, enjoy the evening. And uh, I want to thank Future for Nature for everything you do for us, all of us doing conservation work in so many different places. Last year, we were all together to celebrate the winners from last year, to get together, to talk, to exchange ideas, to establish collaborations. And it was, it was magical. It was another fantastic opportunity that was given to us. I'm very grateful for that. I'm very jealous of all of you all together there celebrating these three amazing individuals. Um, once again, to the winners, congratulations. Uh, enjoy and celebrate Future for Nature. Thank you so much. You guys, you're just amazing. Bye bye. Well, now we would like to um, I'd like to talk a little bit about our wonderful guest of honor, who is somebody who <laughs> is rather special to me. I said I wasn't going to cry when I started talking about her, and damn it. Um, most of you will recognize her face from the many fashion magazines whose cover she frequently graces, or you will have seen her arriving at Amsterdam International Airport because she is the most beautiful Victoria's Secrets uh, aim animal. I mean, uh, angel, sorry. <laughs> 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 uh, who is... <laughs> sorry, Dawson. <laughs> 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 who is uh, standing there at the airport in this wonderful larger-than-life poster welcoming when you arrive in the Netherlands. But for me, um, Doutzen Kroos is um, a guardian angel of an altogether different kind. Ooh. <laughs> because of the amazing work she's been doing, Ahem. helping us save elephants. I met her three years ago when she came to Kenya to help us uh, with a campaign for Save the Elephants basically trying to raise awareness about the horrors of the ivory trade and elephant poaching. And of course, my kids just took one look at this gorgeous woman and fell in love with her right from the start. 
which is always a very good sign. But, of course, we hadn't yet put her through her paces in Africa. Um, they always say that um, you never really know somebody until you've taken them on safari. And uh, anyone who is planning to get married shortly, um, it's a very good uh, tactic to find out whether you're re really suited for a lifelong partnership. Well, um, it didn't matter how early we started in the morning, nor how arduous and difficult the tasks were that we demanded of her. Dalton was there, on time, with an enthusiastic smile on her face, day after day. And even when faced with charging elephants, and we could hear her little heart beating ten to the dozen from the microphone that was pinned on her chest, she still stood there with nerves of heat steel and held that pose until we got the shots that we needed. Well, since then, her dedication to the cause um, and helping us raise money for the Elephant Crisis Fund has helped us support 178 projects in 31 different countries to stop poaching, stop trafficking, and lower um, and reduce demand for ivory. Thanks to this incredible alliance that has been forged of around about 58 partner NGOs under the Elephant Crisis Fund, which has now been named by the European Union as the most effective elephant conservation fund in the world. So today it gives me enormous pleasure to have her meet my other conservation family, um, in whose cause I believe equally passionately, Future for Nature, its laureates and its organizers, whose efforts in the field are second to none when it comes to saving our planet. Dalton, I love you, thank you. Please come onto the stage. Wow, Saba, thank you for the warm welcome, and you actually made me cry as well. Um, getting to know Saba and her whole family who worked so hard on the field in Africa is, 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 has been a blessing to me. And um, I want to thank all of every one of you here and uh, Future for Nature for having me. And uh, it's an honor to be surrounded by such young environmentalists um, that want to change the world for the better, just like me. And I want to explain to you why and how I started uh, getting involved into wildlife conservation. I was born and raised in Friesland, in the north of Holland. And it's famous for its cows, maybe you know, and its Frisian horses. And when the lakes freeze over, it's speed skaters. And my village was at the end of a dirt road. And the upbringing my parents and my younger sister they gave me was a very environmentally conscious one. We recycled, um, we, um, we were very careful with the amount of water we would use. Uh, we would grow organic vegetables uh, before that became a thing. And my sister and I biked 24 kilometers to school each day, even when it was raining. And you know, in Holland it rains a lot. Um, but growing up in the countryside uh, opened my eyes to the beauty of the natural world. And I wanted to do everything I could to preserve that. And I can remember also, as a young girl, I would make little donations to Greenpeace and a Wild Wildlife Fund. And there wasn't much. It was from my pocket money. But it, made me a really, it gave me a really good feeling. And, and, and I felt like I was being part of that group of people who would make the world a better place. My passion for elephants started a couple of years ago in New York City over dinner one night with my agent David Brunovrier and his fiance Trish Goff. And they couldn't stop talking about their trip to Africa where they met Saba and her family as Save the Elephants. And they said, Dawson, you have to go. It will change your life forever. So shortly after that, I found myself on a plane with my family to Samburu, to the National Reserve, to, to, the, to a charity called Save the Elephants run by the legendary family, the Douglas Hamiltons. And it was love at first sight, not just with the elephants, but also with the Samburu, the nomadic Samburu, and the Douglas Hamiltons. And they greeted us on our arrival as we had been lifelong friends. And to me, it felt like coming home. For all of you who have been to Africa, you know what I mean when I say it's special. There is something special about the light and about the scent 
and it speaks to a very Asian part of one's soul. But nothing prepared me for my first time meeting an elephant. Aside from their size and their power, they have an incredible energy and they appear as fascinated by us as we are by them. And then <laughs> Saba made me climb up into a tree for a photo shoot in a long dress. Saba is a hele lieve vrouw, heel stoer, maar ook een beetje gek. And uh, quite the daredevil. And uh, we would sit there up on the tree with the elephants surrounded around the tree, surrounded, they surrounded us and just meters away we would smell them and we would see their, th their skin and every crevice into their skin. And that to me was so mesmerizing and I had such a good time with Saba in that tree and that, that memory just sticks with me forever. And I also felt like my heart would just burst through my skin. But I also come to see a dead elephant. A dead elephant that had just been killed, shot, just for its ivory. That was also overwhelming, but in a very different way. That I cannot understand that ivory is used as a luxury item for fashion, for in, in, in many places people still use it. And when I realized that, I wanted to do everything I could to make a difference. Tens of thousands of elephants are still being killed across Africa each year, just for their fashion, just for owning ivory as a fashion status. Going to Africa did change my life forever, as David has promised, like doing these speeches that I'm, I'm very nervous about every time I'm doing these speeches. <laughs> that has changed, um, but I was determined and I feel like this is my job that I, that I have to do this and tell you this story and uh, spread the word. And when I came back, uh, I, I wanted to, to start a social media campaign because I thought everyone should know about this. It was also my first time when I was in Africa that I learned about the elephant, the elephant crisis. I had no idea and I thought we should tell everyone. And as models, we live a slightly crazy jet set life, but we also have, have an amazing reach. We have a lot of fans all over the world. And I thought that I could gather all my fashion connections and start a campaign. <coughs> they say that elephants never forget. And researchers have long documented their superb memories. So how could we humans show that we hadn't forget about elephants? For generations, people have tied knots, have tied, not, have tied knots to not forget something. Meanwhile, we're forgetting the elephants. We decided that our slogan would be, not on my planet. And this is how not on my planet was born. And never in my wildest dreams, like I just said, I thought I would stand here in front of you doing this speech, but also tell you that we have raised over $3 million in the past few years for the Elephant Crisis Fund. Thank you. Uh, the Elephant Crisis Fund is an amazing joint initiative, like Saba just said, between Save the Elephants and a Wildlife Conservation Network. And 100% of all donations goes directly to the field. <clears throat> and it's working. They're stopping the trafficking, they're stopping the demand, and they're stopping the poaching. Discovering the magnificence of elephants, launching the Not On My Planet campaign, and discovering the Elephant Crisis Fund has helped me to make sense of both my job and my life. It has given me purpose and allowed me to connect all the people that, have, that I have worked with in the past to rally them behind this cause. And it's been a small way of saying thank you for all the blessings that I have had in my life. On my family trip uh, to Samburu, to Kenya, one of the biggest joys I had was watching my four-year-old son sitting in the car for hours, just watching the elephants silently and happily. And he was just as mesmerized by the elephants as we were and everyone else who has ever seen an elephant in the wild, where they belong. Watching my son, I realized that as a mother, 
I wanted to do everything I could in my power to be part of a movement to change. And I wanted to make sure elephants are there still in the wild for them, for my kids, but also their kids after them. I want to be part of the generation that looks back and thinks, we did it. And I think that we can. We can make this happen. We just need to gather all our voices together and make it happen. Today, today I have the chance to listen to these amazing young young champions, <laughs> sorry, young champions that have achieved already so much and I'm so grateful to be a part of that and to be here today. And we should all think of how we could be the wind beneath their wings. I see all of you here and it gives me hope. Hope for a green future where we can live in harmony with the natural world. The life support system that we all depend upon with all its fascinating diversity of life. We each have a tool that we can use to contribute. And mine is the platform of modeling. And I will use it as much as I can to change it for the better. And the young conservationists gathered here by Future for Nature have all found their own tool. And each of them is blazing a trail for us. But each of us, each of us need to do the same. We need to find our tool. And we need to use our talents and our energy to come together and be that generation that makes the difference. So thank you all for being here today. And thank you all for giving me hope. Well, thank you. Last year was Future for Nature's 10th anniversary, and we were incredibly lucky to have 27 out of 30 of the previous laureates uh, who flew in from all around the world uh, to be part of the celebrations. And as you can imagine, when you bring that caliber of people together, there was this tremendous energy and buzz uh, in the room as they began talking. It was like watching um, a long separated pride of lions, a pack of wolves or a herd of elephants meeting together after a long time apart. Um, not only did they find in each other common cause, but there was this incredible convergence of dreams and ideals and vision. And they realized that they all represented these like-minded people who had each other's backs and who were able to join hands to forge the alliance that we so desperately need to fight for a cleaner and greener future. So to welcome this year's winners, um, here's a short message from the champions of last year. Farwiza Farhan, who is the protector of that extraordinary forest ecosystem, the Lusa in Aceh in Sumatra. Um, our very own young Charles Darwin um, from Bangladesh, Siza Rahman. And of course, the, the daughter of Kurdish freedom fighters and the great champion of um, Iraq's Persian leopard, uh, Hana Raza. Congratulations, Adam, Chad, and Geraldine. All deserving winners and inspiring environmentalists. Your hard work, persistence, and resilience has brought you this far. I really, really liked all of your projects, uh, from studying the carnivore human conflict in, in the Himalayas, focusing on the Himalayan wolf, the bird market microfinance program in, in Western Borneo to prevent wild songbird trade, and the customized master degree course in Vietnam focusing on the illegal wildlife trades are amazing. I hope this award will catapult to the conservation work much further than you thought it might. 
Receiving the award last year was one of the most rewarding and impactful experiences of my life. It was a milestone in my career that opened so many doors and introduced me to many people that have been of great help to me in my work. With the help of Future for Nature funds, we were able to achieve a lot of things on the ground. Uh, one of the biggest achievements was that we have established the country's first captive breeding colony of the critically endangered Asian giant tortoise and Arkan forest turtle in Bangladesh for the first time. The Future for Nature Award uh, enabled us to widen the scope of our conservation efforts within the boundaries of our Peace Park to encompass uh, both research and protection uh, of other species. Future for Nature Award was one of the best things that ever happened to my life. It has pushed me far above and beyond what I thought I could do. This flexible funding you could use to your heart content, whatever you think is necessary to bring your work forward. And one of the best things about Future for Nature Award is it gives you the exposure and it helps you to bring credibility and increase credibility of your work both nationally and internationally. Uh, the progress so far has been incredibly encouraging uh, and our team is more uh, um, motivated than ever to continue this work. Uh, but so much of what uh, we've been able to accomplish uh, would not have been possible without the Future for Nature Award. I would like to say thank you for the privilege and honor to be there last year and to send this message of positive vibes and love from Sumatra. Uh, we're all excited to see what great things you all accomplish in the future. I wish you all the best in the coming years. Thank you all. Goodbye. Bye. Well, talking of wolf packs, our first winner today, um, Geraldine Verhan has a, a very strong love for canids running in her family. Hailing from a small village close to the Swiss Alps where she could walk outside every morning into her back garden and, and harvest breakfast from the family's orchard, um, she was always fascinated by the social and emotional intelligence of the many dogs that she was brought up with and has always considered herself to be a key member of their pack. But rather like a lone wolf, she always finds great peace and sanity in wild places. And when she had to go and do a master's degree and suddenly found herself uh, in an urban jungle, uh, she escaped into a forest where she decided to live on her own for a whole year, sleeping out under the stars, um, listening to the owls calling in the forest, and then cuddling up in one great big bivouac bag with her five dogs. Um, and that's where she would fall asleep, feeling very safe, um, but happily in nature. This quest, this drive of hers to escape human-dominated landscapes led her eventually to the high-altitude wilderness of the Himalayas in Nepal where after three futile expeditions of searching higher and higher up into the mountains, she eventually came upon her first Himalayan wolf right up above the snow line at about 18,000 feet, which is around about 5,600 meters. Geraldine is currently doing a, PhD, a DPhil at Oxford University and working with Wild Crew under David MacDonald, who was one of our guests of honor a few years back. And she's basically in this race against time to document all that she can about this completely unknown species, the Himalayan wolf, trying to establish um, its taxon, trying to understand and, and protect its fragile Himalayan habitat, um, where it survives right on the very margins of the living world. We are absolutely thrilled this year to be able to give her this award. And your achievements are really quite phenomenal. Geraldine, please come to the stage. This is the howl of the Himalayan wolf 
the elusive carnivore that I've dedicated the last five years of my life to. This is a story about this Himalayan wolf, but it is also a story about how science informs conservation. The evolutionary unique Himalayan wolf has been overlooked until today. If we want to protect this special wolf, we have to protect its unique high altitude habitats. Thank you all so much for allowing me to stand here in front of you today. I'm immensely grateful for the Future for Nature Award. But let me take you back to that time when I grew up in the Swiss beautiful gardens with my five dogs, and I probably felt more like a dog than a human for large parts of my childhood. I spent my days exploring nature. I made observations and took scientific notes long before I knew that this is how adult scientists actually do behave. So it was always clear that I would dedicate my life to nature. I grew into a passionate naturalist and wildlife scientist, a journey which eventually led me to work in the Himalayas and develop the Himalayan Wolves Project. During my first research expedition in the Himalayas of Nepal, I realized that the wolves there might be different from the gray wolf that is found in North America and Europe. But it was extremely difficult to find these wolves. In all of the lower areas of the Himalayas, they had been killed to extinction. So we had to go to the remotest corner of Nepal to find them, and this was on 5,000 meters, more than 18,000 feet above sea level. That is where we finally found their, them. To get there, we had to take two domestic flights, followed by seven days of walking over high mountain passes. But when I reached there, I also realized that the Himalayan wolf is frequently killed. I had the feeling that these populations are threatened. And clearly, wildlife conservation in these remote places needed a lot of work. But I felt, if we start to protect this unique habitat now, we have the opportunity to conserve something yet still very wild and pristine. So I had my conservation vision and I had my goals, but I had no idea how to get there, how the path to reach these goals would look like. So I simply embarked on my conservation journey and I took one step at a time into the unknown, but always towards the vision on the horizon. I started with questions, following my scientific curiosity to find answers to who is this wolf? Why is this wolf different? How does it live? I was curious about every aspect of this wolf. I had always been fascinated with wolves because of their intelligence and their needs for large landscapes and their power to trigger human emotions. But nobody knew anything about the Himalayan wolf. It seemed like a mystery. So I went out and did research, multiple month long ex research expeditions with a small but dedicated Nepalese team over multiple years. We hiked and hiked for thousands of kilometers to collect data on these wolves, mainly in the form of wolf poo, because wolf poo we can get information on their genetics and also about what the wolves eat. The findings around what these wolves eat, we then relate to the wild and domestic prey availability in the landscape. This helps us to understand the ecological needs of these wolves, but it also helps us to better grasp human-wolf conflict. And in this conflict, the killing of livestock is, plays an important role. People are key to conservation. So we conducted social surveys with the local Buddhist mountain communities across the range of the Himalayas. We talked a lot to these people about their problems with wolf, wolves and other wildlife, and about the role that the different animal species play in their culture. And here is what we found. Buddhism provides a fertile ground for wildlife conservation. But wolves are very much detested here also and frequently killed. Out of five packs that I found in one study area, three packs were killed by smoking out the pups at their den site. And wolves, along with many other species, are traded in the illegal wildlife trade for high prices. 
They use the tongue of the wolves to cure sore throats. The head and the paws are used for good luck in the card games. It is clear that the clock for the Himalayan wolf is ticking. But we also found many exciting results. We found that this wolf is distinct from the gray wolf. Why is that so? It seems the key is in the adaptation to these extreme heights where low oxygen levels challenge all life up there. And we found that its distribution range is much larger than previously thought. It's not only found in the Himalayas, it also spreads across the Tibetan plateau. And we got unique insights into these wolves' social life. This footage I filmed from 700 meters distance with my camera connected to a spotting scope. And it was probably the best day of my life. It's an adult female with her pups. Our many results can now be used to create high-level impact, such as informing the taxonomy of this wolf. Previously, it was just thought to be another gray wolf, but it needs to be assigned an appropriate Latin name. This will be done by the International Union for the in Conservation of Nature, the IUCN. Assigning this wolf a Latin name and hence being able to give it a conservation status is an important justification for our work. Science can impact politics. Our diverse findings around the Himalayan wolf and many other species in these high altitude habitats are starting to positively impact conservation politics in Nepal. In green, you see our three study areas. And one of them, Humla, is now being declared a protected area as a consequence of our work. It is also in Humla that we rediscovered the charismatic wild yak for Nepal in 2014. And this was big news for the little country of Nepal. So eventually, our f my photograph made it onto the latest edition of the Nepalese five rupee banknote. <laughs> Pretty cool. So we collected the genetic data to understand its evolution, inform its taxonomy, an important basis for our work. We investigated its ecology to understand its social life and also understand its prey and habitat requirements. And we explored human-wolf relations to understand main conservation conflicts. With all this knowledge now assembled together, we can start conservation implementation. And this is the stage where we're at now in the Himalayan Wolves project. And this is where the Future for Nature Award joins my journey. I will use the award for implementing long-term sustainable conservation solutions tailored to the high altitudes of the Himalayas. The main problem for this wolf is habitat encroachment. So people bring large numbers of livestock into these habitats. As a consequence, Wild prey is being pushed out and depleted. The wolves are left with nothing else to eat but livestock. So wolves eat, kill livestock, humans kill wolves. To tackle these challenges, we'll initiate community conservation groups to monitor the health of wild prey populations, but also to improve the herding strategies. And we'll provide education to show the importance of each and every species in the ecosystem. The Himalayan wolf can be a powerful flagship for the conservation of the high altitudes of the Himalayas and the Tibetan plateau. These places represent some of the last intact wildernesses on our planet. And if we want to protect the Himalayan wolf, we must protect its ecosystem. When it comes down to how do you do conservation? How do you create real conservation impact on the ground? There is no single recipe that you can learn at university. You simply learn it by doing and by listening to the people. My personal vision for nature conservation has stayed the same since I've been a little child. It is a world where non-human animals and human animals are beautifully interlinked in the web of life. I dedicate this prize to my mother. It is her who has taught me to be a strong, independent woman, a woman that turns her visions into reality.
I don't know if you missed the thing that I think is the most incredible thing about Geraldine's work, but she is defining an entirely new species of mammal. I mean, that is just phenomenal. And that's the kind of caliber of people that we get coming here winning this award. So, Geraldine, well done. Well, Trang Guyen comes from Vietnam, and she's our next award winner. And in Vietnam, as I'm sure many of you know, rather like in China, for a very long time, there was a two-child policy, family planning policy. In a culture where having a son gave a man great status. So when his firstborn child was a girl, Trang's father took great pains to ensure that the next child was going to be male. He sought the services of a fortune teller, who assured him that if he stuck to a strict diet for an entire year and made sure that the baby was born in 1990, he was certain to have a boy. Well, Trang came out as a girl. <laughs> Not her father's preference, perhaps, but the day that girl popped into this universe was a great stroke of luck for the wild world and for wildlife. Dressed in boys' clothes with short cropped hair and toy guns instead of dolls, at her father's stubborn insistence, Trang learned from an early age that anything a boy could do, a girl could manage just as well. And she successfully battled against prejudice and traditional inequality between men and women ever since. You can imagine she was pretty rebellious from the start. She became an expert tree climber and used to leap over the walls of her nursery school and escape into the nearby paddy fields to quietly go and release all the crabs and the fish that had been so painstakingly caught by the rice farmers for their lunch. Well, she's a lot more grown up now, but she's driven by the same sense of compassion and love for nature, and she really hasn't changed very much. And this fiercely independent streak has won her scholarships to study abroad, has led her to research clouded leopards and lemurs, publish her first uh, book, found her own NGO called Wild Act, and be named by Forbes Asia as one of the most influential young people under 30. I won't spoil the surprise by saying anything more about her. She's a force for nature. She speaks as fast as a racehorse, so remember to slow down. And we're absolutely thrilled she's won this award. Trang. Thanks everyone for having me here today. It's a wonderful opportunity for me to tell my stories. So David Attenborough once said, all children find nature interesting. And this is a picture of me when I was only four years old on the beach on a family holiday. I found these tiny little green worms and I was so fascinated by him. My mother said I was sitting there and just watching him, observing him for ages. And then I decided to open space, not safe enough for the worm. So I picked him up and put him to a safer place. But growing up in Vietnam doesn't mean I get to observe nature as it is. I also see the ugliness of the illegal wildlife trade. Back in the 1990s, the Vietnamese government allowed people to keep bears as bear by farming. And so one of my neighbors, he got a bear. We were so curious, we were children, we never see bears before. But they could keep our curious eyes away by having the giant rain cover in front of the bear case. But then one day, I got back late from school with my friends, and we heard some grunting noise, and we heard people talk about bears. So we tiptoeing towing over to see what happening. We saw a giant bear lying on the ground. We saw people surrounding him. We saw a great machine that later on I learned that the type of machine that people use to look at where the gall bladder is. I also saw a man with a giant needles. And he was holding the needles. He pushed it onto the bear chest. And the moment that happened, me and my friend, we freak out, we scream and we run off. We didn't know what bear by farming is, but we know from what we've seen is mean cruelty. And from that moment, I decided that I want to do anything I can to stop it from happening. But it's very difficult. I was only eight years old. 
I don't know what to do. I asked my parents, and my mom told me, "You are a girl. You're not going to the forest. Forget about it." And my dad also told me that wildlife conservation is a kind of job that rich white men in the West would take. For people like us, we're gonna be a teacher, a doctor, or a banker. But those was, those options was not interested to me, and so. I kind of learned. I kind of see what they say was right, though, that everything I found, books or documentary on nature or wildlife conservation, was only English. None was in Vietnamese, and my English back then was terrible. I almost failed English subject at school, so I have to study English and I have to do it well. I also save up my money, my breakfast allowance, so I can go to the cafeteria nearby and use the internet to find if there's any NGOs working in Vietnam in wildlife conservations. I wrote to them, but I was only 13, and as you can imagine, getting an email from a 13-year-old girl who had no experience whatsoever, asking to be a volunteer at your NGOs, the high chance you would say no. But I didn't stop. I was being very persistent. I didn't give up. And then one day, when I was 15, I got an email back from an organization called Traffic, and they said they have an education program. I can come over and be volunteers. And that's how I started to get involved in wildlife conservations. I was also very fortunate. When I was 18, I got the scholarship to go to study in England. I uh, got my first bachelor in wildlife conservations, and that took me to a wonderful place like the Madagascar. And I get to observe the lemurs, following them every day, spend every single day in the forest, observing them, researching them, studying them. I have nothing to do with humans, and that's how I see wildlife conservation back then. Wildlife conservation to me then was to study the animals and to conserve them. Have nothing to do with human. But then everything changed again when I was in Cambridge doing my master degree. I was very sick. And the doctor told me that I had cancer, and he also told me that there is no way I can go to the forest again. And that's all I've been working for my whole life to be a field biologist. <coughs> What I'm gonna do? I was so sad. I was lying on the hospital bed in that morning, trying to read some kind of research to find out what I'm gonna do next. And the doctor came to me. He saw what I was reading—a report on the illegal trade of rhino horn. And how people are using it, and he said, "This is so dangerous, Chang. People are using rhino horn to treat cancer, and in cancer treatment, time is so precious. If you miss out the optimum times, there is no way back. We can't save these human lives. Saving elephants and rhino is so important, but saving these people's lives is so very important too. And what he said just stuck in my head. I keep thinking about it. What he said was true." Wildlife conservation isn't just about saving wild animals; it's about saving human life in the long term as well. And so terrified that I might die anytime soon, I want to do as much as I can. I create an NGO called Why Act, where I give people, young people, young Vietnamese like me back then, who have the passion for conservation, to a chance to do something, no matter how old they are and no matter what their experience, what their experience is.
particularly the Chinese. And bringing with them is the knowledge, the experience, and also the culture. The culture of using elite wildlife products as ingredient for traditional Chinese medicines. Many, many African people I interviewed have used Chinese medicines. Many, many of them are open to the idea of using rhino horn, pangolin scale, tiger bone, lion bones, and many other wildlife parks as part of the medicines. And this is such a worrying trend, because in the long term, Africa might turn into a consumer co continent rather than, the, rather than the source continent as we know it. My long-term goal, though, is not just doing undercover work. I want to create a wildlife course in Vietnam, the first wildlife course in Vietnam to teach people, young Vietnamese people like me back then, about wildlife conservations. I understand that I was very lucky. I get the chance to get out, go to the world, and learn about wildlife conservations. But many of my Vietnamese friends who have a passion in wildlife might have not been that lucky, and I want to share it with them. I understand that in order to tackle the illegal wildlife trade, making people aware of it is not enough. We have to get them involved, empower them, and give them the knowledge on how to stop the illegal wildlife trade. People often ask me, why do you do what you do? Why taking such risks? I believe that I'm still like that four years old little girl, seeing the little worm on the beach and move him to a safer place. I believe that there is a wildlife conservationist within every one of us. And I also learned that the illegal wildlife trade is sort of fluid, flexible, it's changing all the time and changing to all kinds of directions. This is not the problem of the Chinese or the Vietnamese or the Asian or the African. This is a problem of all of us. And so I ask you all here today to join hand with us to support our work and particularly to be a part of the solution to make sure that there will be a future for nature. Thank you. Every year, I think, I can't possibly be more proud of <laughs> these young winners. And every year, I'm even more proud. So, <laughs> trying well done. Well, our last winner today, Adam Miller. When he was a little boy and he was learning to talk, he toddled out into the garden and he pointed his pudgy little finger up into the sky at the great round orb and he said, moon. Born into what he calls a pretty normal life in Missouri in Midwest America, he has always looked to the skies for inspiration. Birds are his thing. And he sees them as the ultimate symbol of freedom, offering these vastly different perspectives from the sky. So as you can imagine, it was pretty easy to buy him birthday presents when he was a kid. Um, bird feeders were always a big hit, and he'd just sit there for hours and hours on end, meticulously recording every single bird that came to eat, learning the names of all of the different species, and losing himself in the beauty of their song. Later, when he came across his first tropical songbird, it altered the course of his life radically and led him to the Indonesian archipelago where he lives today. Just like Geraldine and Trang, Adam is an exceptionally high achiever. But his pathway has taken many different directions. Um, and that meticulous ability to record information and to apply himself to the complexity of learning all about birds has served the cause very well, that attention to detail and his search constantly for deeper understanding. One of Adam's greatest tools is his ability to really listen, be it to the indigenous forest people of Borneo or the Malaysian fishermen on the, on the coast, or even the health of the forest through its birdsong. And what he's learned 
is that many of the drivers leading to environmental destruction around the world are pretty much the same. So his NGO, Planet Indonesia, focuses on people as much as it does on wild species, tackling tough issues like family planning that nobody ever wants to talk about, sanitation, and illegal wildlife traffic trafficking. And thanks to this, this idea always of taking a bird's eye perspective, Adam has reached out to many different points of view, many different talents and perspectives, and brought them to talk at the same table. Adam, we have a lot to learn from your techniques, and I wish you all the best in your journey to reach for the skies. Welcome. All right. All right, well, thank you so much. I have to say to start, I spend most of my time usually sitting next to trees in a forest. So today, to sit next to one of the most beautiful and inspiring women I've ever met, <laughs> it's quite a treat. So thank you to Future for Nature for that. <laughs> so when I was a young boy growing up in the United States, my mom, she asked me one day, Adam, why do you love birds so much? And I remember I looked up at her and I said, it's because they can fly. From the time that I was just a little boy growing up in the United States, I had this deep love and passion for tropical birds. And as you can imagine, growing up in the middle of the United States, there's not a lot of tropical birds flying around. So I went to the only place that I knew that I could access them, my local pet shop. So I started volunteering there, cleaning cages, hand feeding baby birds. And I remember one day a man came into the shop and he brought a large crate of birds that I had never seen before. Their behavior was different. They spent most of their time hanging upside down, feeding off of nectar and fruit. And I went home that evening and I did research on these birds. Where were they from? And this is when I first discovered this land of 17,000 islands in the South Pacific, an area of the world that has the most endemic mammal species and the third highest number of bird species on our planet, but also has some of the highest levels of biodiversity loss in the world today. Indonesia. Indonesia is home to some of the world's most iconic and beautiful species, like the Bornean orangutan, or the critically endangered helmeted hornbill, a bird that is on the verge of extinction because its head is worth five times the price of elephant ivory on the Chinese black market. Indonesia has a real love affair of owning and trading wildlife. For example, every year in Indonesia, over one million songbirds are taken from their forest homes, put into cages, and sold in markets. And this is a short video to illustrate that trade. Orang-orang di Indonesia sendiri emang sudah terkenal buat memelihara burung di rumah, dimasukkan sangkar. Yang namanya budaya ya. Akhirnya semua jadi ditangkap gitu. Jadi lama-lama tetap akan punah. On the island of Java in Indonesia, the most populated island in the entire world, there's a popular saying, in order to become a man, you must have five things. A horse, a house, a wife, a dagger, and a songbird. The practice of keeping songbirds is deeply rooted in culture and is a popular pastime and hobby. This is an ad for a songbird competition. On Saturday and Sundays, men will often gather together, bringing their birds together. And based on their birds' ability to sing and their plumage, you can win awards, such as money, a motorcycle, a television, or even something as simple as a household fan. But there is also a dark side to this trade. 
We often refer to these birds as cut flowers, because just like a beautiful flower that is cut from its roots and quickly wilts and dies, most of these songbirds, when they're stolen from their forest homes, they don't last more than one to two weeks in captivity. And this creates a vicious cycle, because when these birds die, there's only one place to go, back to the market to replenish your lost bird. So next, my journey took me to the island of Borneo, one of the third largest islands on the planet, an area I wanted to go to learn simply from the hunters and trappers and traders. And this is when Planet Indonesia was born, an NGO that I co-founded with four wonderful Indonesians and that has grown to a team of over 50. This is one of the villages that we work in. This village takes about one day by car. After that, one day by motorcycle, and then a half a day hike in to get to this village. This village is inhabited by the Dayak, the indigenous people of Indonesia, of Kalimantan. And up until the 1930s, these people often still practice headhunting and cannibalism. And because of that, they inhabit some of the most rural areas of the Bornean rainforest. I remember going to this village and speaking to a man who was trapping magpie robins and asking him why was he doing this. And he explained to me that he had to trap these birds because he wanted to buy gasoline so that his children could take the motorcycle and drive the long day's drive down the mountain so that they could go to school. I spoke to a man in the same village and asked him why he was cutting down the forest. Why did he have to look for illegal timber? And he explained to me that he needed that money to buy basic tools so that he could farm his land. And this is when the idea of Planet Indonesia was born. At Planet Indonesia, we can serve at-risk ecosystems and species through village-led partnerships. We work to decrease socioeconomic inequalities at the grassroots level through increasing conservation practices. So currently, we offer three services to communities. Business investment and training, literacy targeting women and youth who cannot read or write Bahasa Indonesia, and health services through voluntary family planning and sanitation to improve the lives of those directly involved in safeguarding biodiversity. But there's also another side to my work. In these crates, there's over 700 songbirds. And this is the result of our undercover investigation teams. We partner with the Indonesian government to get birds out of the illegal supply chain and get them back into their forest homes. So I want you to remember with me back to that story earlier today when I was 12 years old, growing up in the United States, working at a pet shop that sold mostly birds from other countries. So in many ways, it's ironic that I'm on this stage today speaking to you all about stopping illegal wildlife trade, when actually my pathway to conservation is because I was directly involved in it. Because of that, I can greatly identify with many of the men in Indonesia who love their songbirds. They've told me before, Adam, in the morning when I wake up, before I kiss my wife, before I say hello to my children, I go outside and make sure that my bird has fresh food and water. It's a tainted love. It is a love that is driving hundreds of species in this country to the edge of extinction. But because of our work, I believe in a paradigm shift, that they can be the, the conservation heroes of tomorrow. Because I believe in conservation that builds trust and that creates optimism and that improves the lives of those directly involved in safeguarding biodiversity. I believe in conservation that does not need to be the enemy of the wildlife trader. It does not need to be the enemy of the wildlife poacher or of the indigenous community or of the law enforcement agency, if it is done correctly. So I hope all of us realize today that we can all be conservationists, from the indigenous community living in the corner of the Bornean rainforest to you all in your daily lives, when you're driving to work, when you're shopping at the supermarket, or even when you're enjoying a beer at the local pub. Nature is for all of us, and therefore, it is all of our responsibility to protect and restore it. So I hope you will join us all on our fight, Geraldine and her wonderful battle to save the Himalayan wolf, where she's discovered a new species, and she's created new protected areas. Trang and her amazing work, where she's risked her own life to do undercover investigations, and where she has a dream to empower the Vietnamese youth so that they can become the next conservation leaders of tomorrow. 
in my own dream to save the song of the Indonesian forest. Because for me, there is nothing more beautiful. There is nothing, there is no greater medicine and there is no greater sign of freedom than this. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, having heard these stories, I'm sure you're all feeling greatly inspired. And I want to springboard off what Adam said. Um, this idea that we are all conservationists. We can all, in so many parts of our daily life, do our little bit. Last year, when we had all of our laureates here, they spent quite a lot of time trying to understand what their common ideals were, what brought them together and where we could go from now. And they came up with this wonderful manifesto of what it means to be willing to fight for the future of nature. It was their pledge to catalyze this paradigm shift that we need across the board to tackle the biodiversity extinction crisis. And I'm going to give you a brief summary, summary of it today so that when you go away, you can take it with you in your hearts and see how it can be applied to everyday life. At Future for Nature, we believe in the responsibility and the power of the individual to bring about change in conservation. Such a fundamental shift requires leadership from a new generation of passionate, committed and independent conservationists that dare to challenge conventions. We are part of that generation. We are a community, united by entrepreneurial skills and guided by the principles of transparency, accountability, innovation, integrity and efficiency. Committed to a conservation ethic driven by strong convictions and moral courage in the face of social political and economic injustice. We fight for a future for nature together. So ladies and gentlemen, as Doubtson said, let's find ways to join hands with Future for Nature, to be the wind beneath these young people's wings, the ones today or any of the 30 who came before them. All of the information about what they do and how to help is on the Future for Nature website, and we'll all be together out on the terrace, and you can have a chat with us later. I'd like to say a massive thank you to the organizers of Future for Nature, all of the incredible volunteers who've committed so much of their time to making this happen, to our three incredible winners, and of course to all of you for coming here today. I'd like to ask you please just to remain seated until our winners have left the room so they can zip off quickly for a photo shoot and then come back and have a chat with you all later outside. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. You're the best. And before we go, we have to do the prizes, which I forgot. <laughs> so, <laughs> can I please <laughs> invite <laughs> our three winners onto the stage? Trang, Geraldine and Adam and Doubtson. God, I'm terrible today. Ladies and gentlemen, please all give a big hand to Geraldine Verhan. Well done, my darling. Come forward a little bit. No, no, stay there. <laughs> okay, off you go. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please give a big round of applause to Trang Guyen. Well done.
Hold up your prize. <laughs> And finally, ladies and gentlemen, the last of our award winners, Adam Miller. Thank you. Come everybody, let's do the pictures. Come a little bit further forward, into the light, into the light. Yeah. Sorry? And now we really are going to come to the end. So if our winners could uh, leave the room with our guest of honor. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. Sorry about messing up there. It's been wonderful to have you all here. God bless. <laughs>